Good morning. Today's class is on foreclosures and short sales. And it's a, a topic that a lot of people aren't paying much attention to in the type of market conditions we are in currently. But um, we're going to be spending a lot of time specifically on short sales, mainly because that's the most complicated part of, of the subject. But is there anybody in this room that's ever completed a short sale transaction or? Not a short sale. OK. And uh, by, hopefully by the end of this class, you won't be afraid to. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of my own history on the subject. So after being in the business for five or six years, we went into a recession. Um, I was in California at the time that started around 1989, but the short sales really didn't start showing up until about 1991. Um, it was the very first team I was ever involved in. And back then, teams in real estate were not very common. Most agents were an island by themselves. And a team was formed because there's so much involved in the foreclosure process. And in this team, back then, from 1991 to 1996, we closed over 1,000 short sales. Of that, you know, also, in addition, probably uh, several hundred uh, bank-owned REO properties that we listed and sold. Then, of course, we recovered from that market, and when the recovery happened, it happened overnight. Short sales basically disappeared in that market almost instantly as prices climbed. And so I had to go back to going out and doing regular business, which I wasn't unhappy about um, at the time. And then, um, as many people, uh, this is a lot more fresh in our memory, is the financial meltdown that happened in 2009 and 2011. By then, I was in Idaho. And at that time, I helped an office prepare an assembly line system so that agents could go out and prospect for short sales, and the office would basically handle the transaction. So it, it helped a lot of agents stay in the business who otherwise couldn't. So we're going to talk about each stage of the foreclosure process, starting with prior to an NOD, which is a notice of default, somebody's going through some sort of financial hardship. The most common one, obviously, is loss of job, loss of income. But they can be caused by a whole other assortment of things. You know, sometimes it's a family argument and somebody just stops paying the bills. Um, there's people who have, you know, it could, it could be drug and alcohol issues. It could be a gambling problem. There's a lot of things that can cause a foreclosure. And foreclosures do happen in all markets for that reason. It's just the, the sheer number of them. I want to go back a little bit and talk about a big difference between the two marketplaces I mentioned, the two recessions. In the first recession, where I had a team doing short sales, there was enough regular business out there that a top producing agent could go out and, and find plenty of business that wasn't a short sale. And it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're busy to be handing one or two short sale files. So we had the benefit of a lot of brokers and agents referring us business. Now, in the second recession, the one that again, is fresh in everybody's memory when we had a, a literal crash in the market, realtors who didn't do short sales left the business because for, there was a period of time where those were the only transactions that took place. Now, currently, and this is just a prediction, I don't know when we're going to go into one of those markets again. I know that it will happen, so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The situation is a lot different than it was in 2010. One is most of you might have noticed, a lot more people have big down payments. And in a recession, prices generally go down like a parachute. And why is that? Has anybody here had somebody that got priced out of the market? <laughs> okay, and they're renting now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a normal recession, market for whatever reason, rate increases, whatever triggers it, prices in real estate normally go down like a parachute. So, it, and the reason for that is, is that there's support at every level that you drop. There's those people that got priced out of the market. Well, they're still out there. They're renting. When they see prices come down, they come back in the market. But if things remain slow, prices will continue to go down. Now, here's a question for you. During an economic downturn, how soon is it before people begin to be upside down in their homes? I'm guessing six months, three months. Immediately. I was going to say, usually 30 days or less. Yeah, because, and, and why is that? Because you have VA buyers that put no down payment. They're already upside down. They don't have, the average selling expense is what, around 7% when you had every fee that's involved. Um, so anybody that did a 3.5% down FHA loan is instantly upside down. So you're going to have people that are upside down on their loans immediately. So they're handcuffed. If they're in a financial 
some sort of financial problem, they literally can't sell without doing a short sale. So here's another question. Can you do a short sale when somebody's not in default? Yes. I believe you can. It can be done, but I can tell you from experience, it's very, very difficult. I mean, you have to prove that there's a hardship and to get them to release your loans, and it, it can be kind of crazy. Now, um, you have a question? Well, could you just maybe define a short sale and like what that really means? Okay, I, I think we all know, but I feel like... A short sale is any time your, your offer price, or actually I should say the value of the property is less than what's owed against it. And a lot of times you think just about the first mortgage, but that would include all liens on the property. You know, once they become upside down and they have no equity, they literally can't sell unless, now I shouldn't say never, because people can bring money to the table to protect their credit, right? And that, that does happen. And as an agent, it's wonderful to have those situations. But in a market where people are losing their jobs, unfortunately, those people are few and far in between and so forth. So. And Kevin, that would be like adjustable rate mortgages as well as when the price of homes go down. Like, you know, right now we have million dollar homes and they go mm -hmm. down to like 500K. So it could be for fixed or adjustable. It doesn't market. matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? It's just what the amount of the lien is. And then, of course, if they've stopped making payments, that amount is growing. Right? So now banks can save an enormous amount of money by doing short sales versus foreclosing on people. However, they make it difficult for people to do. But why? Because in any downturn, everybody would be calling their bank, hey, can you shorten the size of my loan, right? <laughs> so unfortunately, the process requires you to jump through hoops. And there's another reason, too, and I'll, I'll tell a story on that. Back, I believe sometime in the early or, or late 1980s, there was two friends who bought high-end homes. At the time, these were high-end homes in the 600,000 range in Danville, California. They were buddies in school, so they wanted to live right next door to each other. We had a financial downturn and prices in real estate went down and these people were very clever and smart so what they did was they made offers on each other's homes and they got short sales approved and they closed and they shortened their loan amount by over a hundred thousand each and then they, they just stayed in the houses they were in they didn't even move okay? so the banks found out about that you think they liked that Unfortunately for the banks at that time, these people didn't do anything wrong. They didn't commit any fraud. You know, they went through this stuff with a fine-tooth comb um, under the current rules, but the banks still took them to court. Wow. One of the owners that did this was an attorney, so he <laughs> represented himself, and so it was easy for him, and it went all the way to, I believe, the California Supreme Court. In fact, I know it did, and the banks lost which rarely happened. So in their little story, uh, it was you know, a t an attack on the big guy sort of thing. However, that case, like the way California ruins everything else, just <laughs> kidding, um, it caused a whole shift in how the banks do this. So they, they put in a whole series of hoops that you have to drop through because they want to make sure they're not taken advantage of. And sometimes they were taken advantage of, so you know, they had a right to do that. So, that is one of the reasons why things don't make sense. You'll be working on a short sale file and you'll wonder, hey, look, the bank's going to lose all this money if they don't do this deal. Why won't they do it? Well, that's the type of thing that caused the banks to behave that way. Because I'm sure that, that was, that's the case that I'm aware of, but I'm sure there was many other cases like that. Okay. So at the early stages of this, and this class, again, is really, this is a sales class. And it's to give you the sales skills to deal with people that are in these particular situations. Prior to an NOD being filed, the only way you're going to know somebody is having financial trouble is if they contact you. Like it could be one of your past clients and so forth. So you're not often dealing with people in this early, early stages, but the earlier you're, you're meeting with somebody, the more help that you can give them. So sometimes you'll have clients that are in this situation. Now, if it were to happen today, there's a very good chance the majority of your prospects are going to have equity, right? So if it's a person that's about to go into default or it is a notice of default and they have equity, here's the challenge. The challenge is the sooner you sell that property, the more equity you can preserve for them, right? The, the clock is ticking. In fact, 
it's, it's ticking rather fast. Once they're late on the payments, the penalties start to pile up. If the foreclosure process begins, depending on what's in their loan docs, um, but most of them, the fees are going to go way up. So even if they want to, you know, you sell the property at a later date, that equity is getting chewed up as the days go by. So, do you have a question? Yeah, like, what about when you see them in pre-foreclosure? Is that the time to pounce, kind of? <laughs> yeah, we're talking about pre-foreclosure. Pre yeah, so, so the actual foreclosure, we'll get to that, is the trustee sale. So this is the very early stage of the process, which I'm going to go through. So I used to call it three stages, but I added this stage to talk about that period of time because for every foreclosure, there has to be some sort of financial hardship that happens. So that's really where this process is going to begin, right? So we'll talk a little bit about the equity. So here's the sales, how do you put you know, pressure on people? And here's another dilemma you have with those same people. So the person's going into default, the sooner they sell the property, the better as far as preserving their equity, but they're also now not making payments, so the sooner they move out, now they're gonna have to start paying rent. And uh, is our rental market right now pretty easy on people? <laughs> no. no, it's very difficult. So that's gonna be a challenge. So convincing these people to list and sell their property quickly, you're, it sounds like you're, you're putting pressure on them, but the reality is you're actually doing them a favor because they're gonna save money every day you know, that goes by. So again, any other questions on that part of it? So even if it's not a short sale and you have someone in default, it's good to get the clients in addition to the rest of your listing file is to get something in writing to authorize you to discuss the loan with the lender. Now, you'll find that that's always part of the short sale process, and we'll talk about all the documentation in a little bit, but the reason I say that even if it's not a short sale is because I have, as an agent, been able to avoid some of those fees being tacked on by contacting the lender and informing, hey, I'm a real estate agent with XYZ Realty, and I have this client who's going into default, and we are going to sell the property, so if you could you know, hold off on penalties or give them any kind of a break. And I have had some success in that. They don't have to do it, right? They, and then that also re requires talking to a live person. Do you think that's easy? <laughs> yeah, getting a hold of somebody these days is getting harder and harder. So that being said, even though right now in this market, most of your transactions, the people are probably gonna have equity we're going to spend the most time on the short sale process because that is the most involved. But in between that is another scenario, and this is the most difficult type of situation. The people that are borderline as far as their equity. It's almost a short sale. They may have just enough to sell. And then it's a determination, is it a short sale? Often you'll end up listing those properties and they may become a short sale if it doesn't sell right away, or if you have a transaction fall through, too much time goes by, the payments start to pile up. But no, none of us want to work for free, right? If the people have $1,000 in equity, it's technically not going to be a short sale until you add the selling expenses. Most of the time, if somebody's going to be late, then I'm already going to consider that a short sale, right? But you still have to get the clients to approve that, and you have to go over you know, every process of that and make sure that they're agreeable to it. So. Again, any questions at that point? So, Do you understand why that's the most difficult scenario, though? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty hard to tell people, hey, you know, you're going to have to do a short sale when, you know, there's, there's just maybe just enough equity to sell. They see that there's money on the table, but a lot of times that money really doesn't exist. So, so can I had a question. Like, when you first meet someone in this financial hardship, how do you kind of help them make the justification of, short sale, sell now and lower the fees versus wait till later and see what the bank does? Like what, what type of points do you call out to them? Well, basically what you have to do is you have to, you know, during the listing process or during that meeting, you have to analyze the whole situation, Got it. okay? Somebody who's lost their job and has no money, mm -hmm. right? It may be an advantage to do a short sale for a reason I was going to bring up, and that is that a short sale could take a long time. And every month that goes by, they don't care because they're not having to make a payment. And once that transaction is complete, they're gonna be back into the rental market. Mm -hmm. So each person's individual situation. Now, here's another scenario, and there's so many different ones to cover, that's why we have to spend a lot of time on short sales. What if a person has a lot of other assets and just their house is upside down? Is that gonna be a problem? 
Yes, because the bank is going to have you list all your assets. If you don't list them, it's lender fraud. So um, sometimes your short sale is not going to get approved. So these are the types of questions you have to ask the clients. Do you, know, do you own any rental properties? Do you, you know, what other major assets do you have? Because that's going to have a lot of bearing on whether the banks uh, are going to approve the sale in the end. But there's a lot of reasons why the short sale process can take a long time that have nothing to do with the bank's motivations. Sometimes it's just their bureaucracy. So, uh, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, but if, 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 well, no, let me finish that subject too. When you talk about time, how long do you, do you think it takes to do a short sale normally? Three months? Three, three, four to three months. to six months? More like six. Yeah, well, you've heard all those time frames. I had one that closed in less than 14 days, and I've had them go on longer than a year. So that's another area, again, it was tied into another subject where I was going to talk about that. But, like, for example, let's suppose we go into a recession. The people that handle short sales are called loss mitigation people. So a bank will set up a loss mitigation department. They usually have one, but it'll have one or two people in it. But if a recession, then they have to expand that department. And they're usually not in a big hurry because those people get bank executive type salaries or whatever it is. I don't know what they get paid, but the bank's not in a hurry to expand but the number of transactions can expand very quickly. So suddenly they're flooded with short sale files and not enough people to handle them. That's what we had during the last last period of time. So, and your question? Yeah, I was just like wondering with short sales and stuff, like how does the commission structure change? Because the bank pays the commission. Oh, okay. Do they typically pay 3% or is it depending on the bank? Most of the time I got six total, you know. Um, okay. so, so split the between the buyer and the oh, selling so, so agent. The, okay. Um, you know, some of that has changed, you know, unfortunately, but uh, banks were usually pretty good about not, uh, a, a few times um, they've tried to nail you on the commission, but uh, it's rare. Okay. Uh, it was rare. I don't know. A next round of foreclosures, the banks might totally, completely change their process. Almost, yeah. almost every loan now is a Freddie Mac Fannie Mae loan. I've seen a four, too. It was like fours in Ohio. And, oh, you know. Oh, what is the... I think he's right, right. Okay, so the NOD. Once a person's a certain number of months late, the bank files an NOD. Notice of default, which is filed in the county where that property exists. The notice of default is public record, so anybody can find out about it. So as an agent who decides that they're going to work defaults, there's several ways you can go about that. One is the list um, f can be provided from a title company. But if you get that list, some of those are going to be a week or a month late at times. So that's okay in a market like this where there's not that many to chase. But in a market where you're specializing in that, you're going to want to know the same day. Now, the only way to do that is to go to the county recorder's office every morning. And it used to be a microfish you'd have to look at, but now... Uh, you know, they can give you a printout and you could obtain those from the county. As an agent, that's a pretty difficult thing to do every day is to run, and especially if you're working several different counties. Um, so usually what will emerge, I do not know of any service now, but there was services in the past that I subscribed to. These were companies that had workers that would go out every morning, they would gather up the defaults, and they would get sent to your email, you know, every morning, and you'd see the latest default. So, you would want to subscribe to one of those services. The person I had during the last recession passed away, unfortunately. So I would have to find uh, somebody to do that in the future if we go into those markets. But other than that, your only option is to uh, just work the people in your sphere. Now, some of the websites, I don't like to give them any kind of credit. The major real estate websites, they publish defaults on their pages. Have you ever, have you ever had a client call you about a foreclosure but the property's not on the market? Isn't that a pain in the rear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why those companies should be real estate regulated just like real estate brokerages should be because they do things that just don't make sense. Because anything that has a lien against it, this person might have a business that has a lien, but it shows up on their credit report, it shows up on their property, and these houses are not for sale. So you got eight people calling their agents asking them about, hey, there's a foreclosure on this block. Well. Every property that goes into default does not go into foreclosure. People get behind on their payments, and there's a such thing as curing them, right? So, so that's something, too, when you're prospecting, you're going to run into the same thing. You're going to knock on a door, and there. I had one a real high-end home that I went to, and I thought, gee, 
you know, multi-million dollar home and they're late on these payments and these people didn't care less about their credit. They went on a cruise and just didn't make their payments for like four months. And they came back and then they cured the foreclosure and they were so rich they didn't give a darn about their credit score. So you're going to run into a lot of, lot of different types of situations. So, but the NOD is the beginning. Now, as an agent, how do you prospect these leads? So now you have your list. Now what set my team apart and what set the company here in Idaho apart from other offices is we learned right away that the most productive thing to do was to show up in person at their door. And we had a professional brochure. I do not have an example of one with me today. Um, we can talk after the class about how to prepare that, that explained things about the short sale process or the defaults. The one that I revised recently was, you know, for people who both had equity and if it happened to be a short sale, it would explain a little bit. Because if you're taking the time to knock on doors, at least you want to leave something at the door if they don't answer. And so now this is probably the most important part of this class is how do you approach these people. Remember when we did the listing class where we talked about the three things you have to negotiate on a listing are price, time, and commission. Those are the three objections that you're most likely going to get from people that you have to overcome. Well, now it's a short sale. They don't care about the price. They don't care about how long the listing is. And they don't care about the commission because they're not paying it. Okay? Again, a caveat, they, if they have equity, they certainly do care. Um, but in a short sale situation, they don't. The other thing is, is that regardless of who the person is, they're dealing with a pretty traumatic situation, right? So as an agent right now, you got a first time buyer that's excited about getting their first home. You have a seller right now that's thrilled about these high prices that they're getting these days. Well, that all gets reversed. And now you're dealing with somebody who's emotionally compromised on every transaction. And that gets to be really draining on your own psyche because every situation you go to is, is a tragedy. And so you go there, you do your job, but you have to try really hard to not let that affect you. And you're going to have to show a lot of empathy. And so that first contact you make from a you're knocking on the door of somebody in default, you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to have people literally sometimes, and it's happened, on the verge of suicide. Right? Another person that has a complete sense of humor about it, which is a real joy because there's not going to be many of those. Not many of these people are very happy. Not only that, what do they think they're not paying their bills? If they're not paying their mortgage, is, it likelihood, is there a likelihood they're not paying their other bills? Yeah. So if they see you walking up to the door in a suit and tie, they think you're a debt collector, right? So the immediately when you contact these people, you need to disarm them. You know, look, I'm here to try to help. Um, I'm not from the bank. I'm an agent that specializes in helping people in your situations. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's thousands of other people that have been in the exact same position you're in. I would even sometimes say I myself have had similar situations that I've had to deal with, so you're not alone. And a lot of times that will. And at that time, too, they usually don't have a lot of love for the banks. So I might throw in there, too, um, I'm no fan of the banks. And a lot of times that would get their radar up a little bit. I ran into a situation, I don't want to tell too many stories because there's a story behind every one of these, where I was knocking on the doors and I ran into a family that didn't speak really good English. And when I answered the door, this lady invited me in um, through sign language, and she had a husband who was recovering from a surgery with an open wound, and they had you know, a hospital bed in the middle of the room. And I was telling her, you know, I thought it was a short sale situation, and she was able to convey to me that they had the money to pay off the loan, and when she contacted the lender, they would not accept the payment. They were telling her it was too late. Now, I knew, the, the for, it wasn't early in the NOD process, it had been going on some time, but I looked at my notes and it was a small bank and the property actually, it was in a short sale market, these people actually had a lot of equity. And I immediately knew what was going on here. That somebody at that bank was going to get brownie points by foreclosure on that property. And so I spent the entire rest of my day, I'm not getting any commission out of this, making sure and forcing them and arguing with them and reinstated that loan. Spent the whole afternoon on the phone, cutting through the red tape, threatening to sue them. And I said, I, you know, you'll be on the 5 o'clock news, you know, if you don't, you know, you've just told these people that they, you're telling me 
They told me when they didn't know who they were talking to that it was too late. The, the trustee sale was over a month away and they were telling me that they couldn't receive a payment. And so anyway, I helped those people save their house. So when you're doing this, you know, there's times when you are adding a lot of value to the public just with your own expertise. But you're gonna run into a lot of different situations and a lot of them are not like that. So let's suppose the person's upside down and meaning they don't have equity in the property with the number of liens and you're sure it's a short sale. So should the people care about how much, I mentioned already they don't care about the price, but should they care? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. They should care for a number of reasons. One is, the higher the sales price is, the more likely your sale is going to get accepted by the bank. right? If they just accept some lowball offer, their, their chances are not improved. Um, another reason is, and I can't give tax advice, but there could be a tax consequence. And um, if they get mortgage relief out of that short sale, that's a possibility. Now, the federal government gave people some relief the last time around. I don't know if that's been extended, but that would be something if you're doing a lot of short sales to research and, and understand. Um, a motivation for someone to do a short sale. Okay. So I know like sometimes they went to the, the COVID Relief Act and those kind of things could impact how much money you can actually get out. Because I'm assuming the federal people get money first before the banks will in those situations. Yeah, I don't quite understand that question now. So the COVID relief money? So they're like, you can get mortgage relief, but you don't pay your mortgage for a while. You get forgiveness, and then they also are in default. So I Yeah, I, how that equates in that, because yeah. I haven't had to deal with one, I, I can't really answer. Okay. You know, Got so it. I know that they delayed the foreclosure, mm -hmm. but once that ends, then the foreclosure process, the same as if a bankruptcy period ends, then yeah. the, the clock will start running on that foreclosure oh. again. Oh, mm -hmm. if, they don't, if they don't cure it, well, so. I mean, the banks aren't going to let you live there for free forever, you know, so, so at any rate. So I mentioned before that um, banks don't want to necessarily make it easy, but you might have clients that don't make it easy. So the problem that you will face doing short sales is that these people are in a negative situation that they're not excited about, but you need a tremendous amount of participation from them for a short sale to be successful. So there's a whole series of documentation that you need, and you'll need to continue. If it gets dragged out, the more documentation the bank is going to require. Like if you give two months bank statements up front and three months go by, they're going to want another bank statement. If you can't get a hold of those clients and they don't cooperate, and that is why it's almost necessary, if you're doing more than five of these, you're going to have to have some sort of assistant or some sort of transaction coordinator who's trained and skilled in this process that'll help you chase down those documents. I have had situations where I listed a property and they seem completely cooperative, and then you never hear from them again. You go out there and you find out that the property's vacant, that they just desert, you know, and just abandon the property. Or I've had people that stay in it and they just aren't organized and can't get you the documentation you need. And so that's gonna be a challenge that you're gonna face in, in that situation. So what documents do you need? I'll go over that, but before that, I want to explain two different processes. And one of them is going to be, unfortunately, not as common, but i got to spend a lot of time on it because it's a little bit more complicated. So because there were so many short sales in 2009, 2010, the banks set up a system called Equator, which is a computer program that they use for all kinds of ways to communicate with agents and appraisers. Um, you know. REO listings are handled through this Equator program. And so, you know, setting up an Equator uh, program is fairly easy. Some of them might need a broker approval, you know, for you to do. But that took away, and I'll explain why, a lot of advantages I had over other agents. So doing short sales the first time around, I'm going to go back to the 1990s. Um, my partners and I, every time we dealt with a loss mitigation person at a particular bank, we kept a file on them in our CRM. So who we contacted, the bank, who we found who was helpful, who you know, took care of business at, at Wells Fargo, they took that away from us later. You didn't have any personal contact. Every time you called, you got a different person. So not only that, then what we want to do is you know, learn about the people. You actually built a personal relationship. Now, the only reason I'm even mentioning that now, even though I'm calling it a thing in the past, is you will still run into this with some of the smaller lenders where it will be, you'll, it'll be a vice president in that bank or somebody who's assigned to take care of the small number of short sale files they have. Now, 
here, here was the concept. The concept was this loss mitigation person who works for this bank, it's not their money. It's just their job. They go home at 5 o'clock. Now, they may have a big, giant stack of short sale files over here from agents from all over the country, and one person sends in a little partial file, you know, another person sends a little bit of information, and then that loss mitigation person has to open up that file and then contact that agent and request a whole series of documentation that they need to complete that file. So as a professional, uh, dealing with this for a while, we learned that let's make that person's job as easy as possible. So before we sent out a short sale file, it was complete. We would call any, any lender if it was the first time we dealt with them, and we would say, what do you want to see in a short sale file? And we would get that list, and we would make sure that we had every bit of that. The cover sheet would have uh, documentation with a table of contents, basically saying everything that's in that file, and we would go down the list. Now, when I originally was doing this, we were faxing these to the bank, but of course, now obviously that would be email. Now, you got this loss mitigation person who gets rewarded for how many files they successfully complete. If they've got a big giant mess over here to the left and then they've got your complete file, your file is going to go through faster that way. Doesn't that make sense? It's just sad that they kind of took that away from us. So now they have this equator system that I mentioned. You submit a file. The first document you always need is authorization to discuss the loan. And I want to I want to add one thing too. Most lenders, you find out that this lend is Citibank. You can usually go to their website and you can fish around and you can probably find their form for authorization to discuss the loan instead of trying to use it. They may want their own form. Some do. Some would use a generic form that I would create. So you definitely go there. And then on the same side, you could usually find, instead of calling somebody, because you're not going to get a hold of anybody anymore, um, you might be able to find a list that that bank would require in a short sale package. So you may be able to get all that there. Now, if you do miss a document, they're going to ask for it. But again, we had a lot of success because we tried to make their job as easy as possible. So now, with the equator, it's a little bit different. And this is why you almost always need an assistant from now on. The equator system sends you an alert. And in the middle of the file, they say, well, we want tax returns from this year. And if you don't do it within a certain period of time, your file expires and it gets kicked back to the beginning and it starts over. And uh, it's kind of ridiculous because they make you wait weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and you might be on vacation and all of a sudden, we need this, we need that, we need this. <laughs> now you have your client who's depressed over the whole situation and now you got, I need this document and I need it now, right? Now, on one hand, they made things easier to a degree by having the system in place. On another hand, they took away any type, anything that could make you stand out as an agent in that process. They've kind of robbed you of that. So, any questions on that part? Or? Okay, so now we're going to talk about what motivation, when you meet with a potential short sale customer, do they have to sign up with you? Now, right now, if you're dealing with an equity seller, you're convincing them how you're going to get the highest possible price, et cetera, et cetera. You're competing with lots of realtors out there. You're going to talk about your marketing. The short sale presentation is going to center around a lot of you convincing them that you're the right person, that you have the technical skills to make this happen, that you have the experience working with the bank, et cetera. So that's going to be how the presentation is going to change. If you have a very analytical person who's, uh, their, their goal is to protect their credit and they're pretty sophisticated people, they just happen to be in the situation, that's what they're going to focus on. You know, they're going to ask you some tough questions. and. Um, that's where, you know, saying that you uh, have somebody like me in your pocket, you could all claim, gee, I work with a guy that's close thousands of them. You can all say that as EXP agents, you know, or, or other offices too. And you could use that in, in, your, in your sales pitch, you know, so um, that'll be helpful. But um, now the government gave an incentive the last time around in a program called HAFA. And that was where the, the if you, the reason for that was there were so many foreclosures taking place that the government wanted to start to limit it. So they offered an incentive for people to do a short sale. That had never existed before, and of course that was a huge help. Because when you knock on the door and say, hey, I can get you X thousand dollars by completing a short sale. So, but they have other motivation. One is, um, 
they could get more time in the property. Well, when you're doing a successful short sale, that trustee sale date gets closer, you can often get a postponement on that. So that's longer that the period, that might be the person's only goal if they're really in financial straits, that you may be able to, look, I can help drag out this process a lot farther and uh, have done that you know, many times. And the bank just does it anyway by taking too long, so you almost automatically can buy them more time. Another thing is, it's obviously to protect their credit. Now, if you have a short sale and you're in default, you obviously have credit score issues, right? Now, people will say, well, is there an advantage? There is a slight advantage. It is better to have a successful short sale, which is a forgiveness of the debt, than to have a trustee sale. The worst thing for their credit, and I, you know, I'm not an expert on this, I actually called credit counseling people to ask this question, what order it goes in. The worst is a deed in lieu. Do you know what a deed in lieu is? That's where the bank contacts them and says, hey, you just deed the property to us. It'll be a signed contract. The bank likes that because there's not a lot of liability because it's a mutual contract where they've agreed to walk away from the loan. But that's actually the worst for the credit. And the banks will lie to people and say, this is better for your credit because I've had that happen. And the reason why, the way the credit recording people look at that is you just gave up. In a trustee sale, at least you may have tried to fight till the very, very end. And so I don't really know if that's changed, but that was the last time I talked to people, that was the order it went in. So there is some advantage credit-wise to doing a short sale versus, so that's one of your selling points, right? Some people just don't want to have a foreclosure from the stigma of foreclosure. They would just much rather, you know, they'd feel better about themselves if they were to go through that. So any questions there? So the deed in lieu is where you just kind of, the bank takes it and you walk away. Correct. Immediately. You don't sell it, they don't go anything through any of the sales process. Correct. But there is usually a contract involved and the bank's trying to limit their liability. I give this brings up another story. A small local bank, which I will not name because they're really not bad people, but they had done a loan where they had made some serious mistakes when they created that loan. Some mistakes that could have got them in some sort of trouble. And I was attempting to do a short sale. And this particular bank kept trying to convince the client to do a deed in lieu. And they were trying to tell me, we really, we want these people to do this. And I found out why. <laughs> and I was able to, I wouldn't call it blackmail, but it was a vice president at a local bank here. And I said, look, I understand now after looking at this original loan file, why uh, you want to do a deed in lieu, but we're doing a short sale. So the best thing for you would be to just cooperate in it and the deal closed and, uh, but, you know, banks would have different, but, but their main, um, usually when a bank wants to do a deed in lieu, there's some sort of liability issue. So, anyway. So, the file itself. Here's what needs to be in a file. Okay, the first thing you need in a short sale file is an authorization letter to discuss the loan. Again, you can find these on their websites. I had a generic one. Sometimes they would accept it. Some banks wouldn't. So, it's easier to check first if they require their own form first. And they're not going to discuss anything with you unless the client's given you that authorization. And that's, that's true with any creditor. I mean, you've probably ran into that across the board. That's not uncommon. The first thing is a hardship letter. The hardship letter is just a short explanation of why the people are in default. Now, what's different in a short sale versus getting a loan? When you are applying for a loan, you're trying to convince that lending institution how qualified you are. Well, now a short sale file is the opposite. You're trying to unqualify those people for that loan. So the short, short sale, uh, the hardship letter should just basically state, you know, what, you know, I lost, it's really easy if they lost a job or if they had income. Um, we had a lot of people that just really, for some reason, again, it's hard to get them to participate. We've typed these letters for people and had to sign them by just, you know, because it was easier than asking them to produce this letter. Um, I used to have a partner that was just a master at writing these things. I mean, some of those things were a work of art. I think I should stick them in a book. You know, he'd go in, you know, on day 16, the puppy got run over by a car, and we got hit by vet bills, and my kid has this disease, and, um, you know, you'd want to cry at the end of these, and go, just get, get, let him out of their loan. And, uh, but that's what, but it does not have to be a novel, and it just needs to be simple and to the point, and, you know, 90% of the time it's going to be a loss of income of some sort. So um, medical bills is probably the next thing that ends up getting people behind. So um, the hardship letter. 
They're always going to ask right up front for two months bank statements. I said that plural. If on their list it's not plural, send them one bank statement. Don't send them all their bank statements. They may have a bunch of money in another bank account. Now, you're not committing fraud. If they ask for all their bank statements, give it to them. But if they don't, give them their checking account, whichever account has the least amount of money in it. <laughs> <laughs> I say that a little bit jokingly, but, um, but that's how that works. Um, they're going to want pay stubs. If they're out of work, are they going to have pay stubs? No. no. Okay. But if they, have, if they are still working, you'd have that. Um, usually, they're going to want two years' tax returns. They're going to want W-2s if they're working. Um, so often, some lenders, I would include a CMA to try to justify what the price is. You need a signed purchase agreement. And with that, if it's a cash deal, you're going to need proof of funds. You're going to, just like you would any transaction, you're going to need an approval letter if they're out obtaining a loan. So. <clears throat> Occasionally in this process, they may want that buyer to apply at that lending institution. They, does, they can't force them to get their loan there, but at least then they have the buyer's credit information, but that's actually a way that they try to just hustle more loans. It, it happens rarely, but it, it has happened. So. It's kind of just a preference, not the law, right? I'm sorry? It's a preference, not the law. Like, it's kind of like when they say, I prefer this title company. Would they say, I prefer this buyer go to our loan? Yeah, it's going to be one of those things. Okay. But when you're trying to get a short sale approved, so I'm, you know, you're, you're probably going to want to play ball. Yeah. Okay. What, now, here's a question that I always bring up. When you're doing a short sale, who are you representing? Are you representing the client or the bank? Client. You all got it right. Even though the bank is an incredibly important person in this transaction and it's not going to close without their help, um, you're representing the client, not the bank. And where does that come into play? It comes into marketing. So one thing that some of these lenders do, especially some of the second lien holders, they require that you put the property on their website when it goes for sale for people to bid. Because some of those lending institutions own stock in the companies that have those auction websites. Okay? Now, is it up to them how you market the property? No. So I had this argument with a bank and it caused me to cause, call the real estate commission. And I called the real estate commission here in Idaho and I went over the situation. I said, hey, look, this bank is uh, requiring that we put these properties on their auction site. I think that goes against Idaho real estate law because as a listing agent, I'm representing the seller. It's up to the seller how the property's marketed. And this person at the commission was agreeing with me, agreeing with me, agreeing with me. And I thought I was really making some headway. And at the very end of the conversation, he says, well, you're right, Mr. Rushton. So what I suggest you do is you get together with some other real estate agents and brokers and file a class action suit against the bank. <laughs> so this is a violation of Idaho real estate law. You confirm that with me, but it's on me. And what that is is uh, most of these banks, they have deeper pockets than the Idaho Real Estate Commission, and they're not going to take on the banks. That being said, I don't want to beat them up too much because after having dealt with that situation, Here's how you want to look at it. You can play ball with the bank. It's like, are you going to fight City Hall, right? Do you want your short sale to get approved? You're representing the client. You want to get it done. So is that argument the hill you want to die on? No. So unfortunately, even though it goes against Idaho real estate law, if they ask you to put it or try to force you, however you want to word it, you're going to want to do it on their, on their site. Now, why is that problematic? I will talk about the buyer, OK? <clears throat> So as a person who does a lot of short sales, or has, or if you're going to be doing that, picking out the buyer is more than just the highest possible net. Do you know when a short sale is going to close? You might have some first time buyer that needs to be in a house in the next 60 days. And if that file is not approved, they're going to walk, right? So you're not going to want really to be in contract with that kind of a buyer. Um, somebody who understands that you know, this might be a six month process, might be a year process, and understand that before there's a short sale approval, the price might change because the, the lender might ask for more money. So if they go to this auction site, then the highest bidder might not be the buyer you want to have in the contract. So that's going to create a problem for you. And you might go through three or four buyers before you close a short sale if it's a long one. And every time you replace that buyer, it just buys the client more, more time in the property. So any questions on that part? Can we, can we talk more about the highest bidder and 
how that works. You mentioned that sometimes the highest bidder doesn't get the house. Is it because of the longevity or the price change? No, I'm saying the highest bidder won't get the house if I'm handling it as a listing agent. Uh -huh. Because I'm going to look at that buyer and I'm going to say, look, I want somebody who understands that this is a short sale. Now, if I had it my way, every, every buyer on a short sale would be a cash investor. Because what does an investor know? Because I'm representing the seller. I want to have a successful close, right? Yeah. The investor knows that they can put earnest money down yeah. and they can wait. It's not costing them anything. And the bank's going to come back and at that point, that investor can decide, does this make sense for me to go forward or not? They're not going to lose anything, right? A regular first-time buyer doesn't understand, why can't I do this? Mm -hmm. Why can't I have the seller replace the hot water heater? Why I can't was, I, yeah. okay, so, you, you know, like I said, if I had it my way, every buyer on a short sale would be, uh, someone who's not going to give you that problem. But I'm, I want to try to weed out those people. Why? Because I'm representing the seller, right? Now, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, is it common for people to ask for repairs on short sales? Yes, because the agents who are representing those clients may not have explained what everything there is to do with a short sale, right? So they just may think they have the right. So that brings up another issue because the Idaho con contracts almost encourage this on a short sale. So. If you were to get an accepted offer on a short sale, when does the inspection period begin? When the bank approves the short sale or in the beginning? See, a lot of people during the last recession felt like it should be once there's an approval. So here you've waited six months for the bank to give you an answer. The bank has approved a certain net. That's taken six months, et cetera. All of a sudden you have a buyer who wants to order their inspection and if they find out something's wrong, they could back out or they want to renegotiate. And you do not want to send that file back to the bank. So if it's going to be one of my listings, I don't care what any other broker or agent has to say, you're either going to buy it as is or you're going to get your inspection up front at the beginning of the process. Now their arguments can be, well, I don't want my client to spend $350 for nothing. Well, it costs money to buy real estate and it costs money sometimes to not buy real estate. Unfortunately, again, if you're worried about $350, that's a great way to weed out a weak buyer. <laughs> Right off the bat, right? So, then that makes sense. So, I hope it does. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, for, yes. for mine, it was, it was a short sale. I just made it an optional inspection, so I knew what was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, I could put the home warranty on it afterwards. But mm -hmm. um, I made it, it wasn't a contingency for the sale. I just said, I just want the house. Just yeah, and you know, you could do that, for, like again, for your own benefit. If the contract mm -hmm. says, that's why I said as is, mm -hmm. or if it's not as is, you need to sort this out up front. Yeah. Right, so, another thing too, when a person's in default, they're not going to have money to maintain it, right? So it is understandable that the condition of the property six, eight months later might be different when the buyer first saw that house in the very beginning, right? <laughs> yeah. but, even, but even then, again, they don't have bills to fix things, right? So, so um, that is an issue. And, and again, most investors, they're, you know, they're getting a good price on it and they're, you know, so forth. Now, price. Now, during a short sale process, the bank can order as many appraisals as they want. It's really common to have, it used to be common to have three, and then they started doing BPOs, which are broker's price opinions. Usually there'd be one appraisal. Now, the way they use algorithms in a lot, and they cancel out, I don't know, they probably are gonna do less appraisals in the, in the beginning, but those appraisers can make or break your files. And it's really frustrating when the person doing the broker price opinion is your competitor. <laughs> <laughs> They're not gonna help you necessarily. Now. Here's something they're not going to share with you. They have a magic number. Now, back in the old days, when you dealt with a live person, sometimes you could find that what that was. And what that magic number was, after they took the average of the appraisals, how close of a margin does the offer have to be in order to get accepted? I know that there was 12%, there was 14%, but they're not going to share that with you normally. Why? Because if you know it's 14%, they're going to have a lot of offers that are exactly 14% below the accepted amount. Correct? So you're going to understand why they keep that. So that formula might be changing. So, but they're working within a certain parameter. And again, that person, that loss mitigation department person, they're sitting there. Now, then they issue what's called an approval letter is what you've been waiting for now for six months or three months or a week. The approval letter is the equivalent of a counteroffer. And let's suppose your offer was 300,000, the bank comes back at 310. You go back to your buyer, they agree to the 310, you just write a simple counter offer for your regular real estate file. And that reminds me that I did miss something. On a short sale, you still have all the other required paperwork when you put it in the MLS and what you need for your file as you would any other listing, okay? I just wanna add that to it. So obviously with your buyer at that point, you would have to, now if they say no, 
Well, now you have an approved price from that bank. Let's suppose that investor backs out or that buyer backs out of the deal. So now you have what's called, and some of you may have seen in the MLS before that this is an approved short sale, okay? Um, now, what if there's a second on the property? I'll tell you a little bit of something. Uh, my record, I think, was 39 liens wow. that I closed on a short sale one time, okay? I had another one where the people had a half a million dollar federal tax lien against them. And during the initial interview process, when I heard that, most people would say, this file is dead. But this person had already told me they worked for a state senator. And so I asked, literally, I said, is that state senator? That state senator was now a real senator. And I said, can you contact that person and see if they can help you with this? And we actually got them to release the sale through there. Speaking of that, is another question. Can you sell a property when it's in bankruptcy? Yes. Okay. So what that is, what's required is a, a process called a relief of stay. Okay. Now, at that point, the people already have an attorney. Okay. Now, I've had many attorneys who are very cooperative. Where yeah. Now, the lender doesn't mind because they're thrilled about getting that property released from the bankruptcy, you know, and out of, out of their hair. Because bankruptcies can be dragged out a long, long time, and the banks can't start the foreclosure process until the bankruptcy is over with. It only costs a couple hundred dollars. I don't know, it may, it may go up, but I, I can't tell you what attorneys are gonna charge, but um, sometimes the people don't have the money. I've paid the fee before. And when you're getting a full commission from the bank, it's a no-brainer. But I've also had attorneys that wouldn't cooperate on it. And that's problematic because you can't give legal advice. Well, you shouldn't be giving legal advice. So um, I know more about the short sale process usually than the lawyer does, but the lawyer certainly knows more about the bankruptcy process than I do. And there might be some other issues you don't know about it, but I've, had, I've been really frustrated before when a, when a lawyer wouldn't cooperate with a relief of stay, but they, I'm sure that they had their legal reasons. And, and if you run into that, you might run into a dead file. Unfortunately, the people then are probably going to just foreclose. So. Here's where I skip around a little bit. I talked about second liens and I didn't finish that subject. Okay, so um, the second lien holder, if it forecloses, they're out of luck, right? <laughs> Here's a scenario. Um, the bank has the first mortgage and a private investor has a private mortgage. At some point in that process, you call up that person and say, hey, look, I'm working on a short sale. I'll give you a thousand bucks on your $40,000 loan, okay? <laughs> now, when it's a mom and pop private loan, that's a huge hit for them to take, right? They're usually gonna be institutional loans, but what will happen in the short sale process is the first lien holder knows there's a second. The first lien holder knows that the second has to sign off. So the first lien holder will usually dictate how much money can be allocated to that second. If they say nothing, and sometimes they do, it can be problematic, right? So. Uh, now, there's all kinds of other liens that might potentially have to be negotiated. The one I had the least success with is medical liens from the local county, Medicaid liens. Um, and it wasn't so much that it didn't you know, make sense to them. They just don't normally have a process of dealing with it. You either pay it when they think everyone has equity and they don't understand how this stuff works and you're trying to explain to them that it's a short sale and they Maybe they do now, but back when I was doing it, they just didn't have the tools to deal with it. So let's suppose um, you close, you're successful, you have a successful short sale close. It's no different than any other close. The difference is, you know how today we like to take our picture at the title company with the key to the house and everybody's smiling? <laughs> you're, you're not gonna have that with your short sale closers or your short sale buyers. So no basket? Nah, you know, gift back. I've done a lot of things to, help people out over the years above and beyond that were in those situations. Like, like sometimes they don't, you know. Now, let's go to the part now. We're gonna talk about foreclosures. Okay, so the person either doesn't try or the success, the short sale was not successful, but for whatever reason now, we reach stage three, which is the trustee sale. In some states, like the state I originally worked in, they were literally done on the courthouse steps. You stood out on the steps and they would shout out the bid prices um, here in Idaho, they're usually held at title companies. Um, there might be some others at the courthouse, but um, all the ones I've attended have been at title companies. 
and you need to have cash to bid. The lender will set the bid. Usually, they set the bid based upon the loan amount. In a down market, a lot of times that loan amount's higher than the current value, so you don't get a lot of bidders and the banks end up taking back the majority of the property. Some banks who literally want it to sell at a sale, they'll start reducing that minimum bid until they get the property sold. But most of the time, if a property doesn't sell at the trustee sale, it will go back to the bank. So as an agent, how do you get paid at a trustee sale? Sold. <laughs> the trustee sale is going to be auctioned off there. So you might have an investor client who wants to help you. Um, say you have an investor client, hey, can you help me with trustee sales? You as an agent, right? So the bank's not paying a commission at that stage, right? So the county's not going to pay it. Um, the buyer has to pay it. So you need a buyer rep from that buyer for that trustee sale. Now, why would they do that? Because they could simply show up there, they could bid on it, right? So you have to add value. If you don't add value, you got no business being paid on these anyway. And here's how you add value. At a trustee sale, there's no title insurance. So any liens that are superior to that loan are gonna hang on with the property. So an investor could make a terrible mistake. Another thing is they don't always state whether it's a first or a second at these sales. And somebody who's rushing because they see a good price, okay? So as an agent, you have to do the research ahead of time. So anything that's recorded at the county recorder's office, and this process is evolving. So there's always going to be some risk involved. There's other things too, like is the property occupied by a tenant with a long-term lease? Shouldn't your investor want to be aware of that? So you as an agent can be the person going out and doing that legwork, going out and finding out if the property is vacant. But the liens are the most important issue. Now, when we were doing a tremendous volume of these, we had cut a deal with the title company because the title company at the last minute can run a scan to see what liens were on the property for you. But it's expensive. It's expensive for them to create a prelim. And if you're bidding on trustee sales, you're going to research a bunch of them that are never going to happen. Because just because it's scheduled doesn't mean it's not going to get postponed, canceled, Sometimes they're cured at the last minute. I've been responsible for that many times. So you had to prepare a cashier's check, show up that morning to find out it got canceled an hour earlier than you showed up. But there are opportunities there for investors. So you, you do have to just get used to that process. And if that's what you're doing for a living, you don't get discouraged. You just keep going back, knowing that they're not all, this, they're not all gonna go through. But a lien can be filed at the very last minute. So here's an advantage you don't have. What we used to do, I had partners, we literally would have one partner with a cell phone at the counter. And when I say with a cell phone, believe it or not, back then not everybody had one. <laughs> <laughs> we would have a partner with a cell phone, weren't we special, at the recorder's office staring at the desk trying to see if anybody was going to record something at the last. You don't know what they're recording, but you could look at the microfiche. And we promised that service to a client. But you know, a lien could slip through. So let me read off what types of liens that are superior to a mortgage. Department of the Treasury, state tax liens, liens by USA or Department of Justice, Department of State, any other federal agency. They're all superior to those liens. Uh, code enforcement liens, uh, demolition liens, or I don't, I don't actually know what that's one, I don't know what it is. Uh, child support liens can. Um, city liens, like HOA liens, right? All of these might come along with the property. Um, this list is easy to look up online, so I don't have to read off the whole thing to you. But obviously, you're going to want to be educated on all of this, right? Now, there's liens that are only superior if they were recorded prior to the loan. Some of these liens, if they're recorded after the loan was created, won't apply. So again, you have to research all that. And again, when the title company has to prepare a prelim, we were doing enough volume that a title company was willing to give us the raw data. If you ever see a prelim that's produced by the title company before it's put into real language that you can understand, the whole thing is a series of codes. And those codes match any, all types of credit issues, et cetera, that you know, gives them enough information where they're willing to issue title insurance. And so, they would send us the raw data and that saved them energy because we were requesting so many of them. And then what we had was the, the most agents won't be privy to 
was how to decipher all those codes. We had the translation for those codes. So we would have to sit down and go, what does CH3 mean? Oh, that's a garbage company lien, you know, and et cetera. So, you know, those are things. So any questions on that part? So what you would do if you're going to bid, because you, you, you're probably going to set a limit like you would any auction, like this property is this, this is how much, this is what I think it's worth, this is what I'm willing to pay, but the minimum bid is one thing, maybe it'll go a little higher. So you need to have a cashier's check. And then what you do is you have a series of smaller checks in case you have to overbid. Because if you don't have cash there, you, you, the property goes back to the bank. They're not going to accept it. So you have to have that cash. And then the bank will, uh, the person representing the bank there will cut you a check for the difference if it's an odd amount. So when you're doing this, you spend a lot of time running back and forth to the bank, bringing the cashier. Your teller at the bank obviously is going to figure out what you're doing after a while. I brought a lot of cashier's checks back to the bank because I didn't actually bid on the property. So. Now, if you have a buyer rep sign with those people, again, I'll go over that one more time. I charged 3%, but I could easily justify that too, mentioning the systems that we had in place for this. So it was very easy for me to rattle off to that investor what value I'm bringing to the table. You're definitely going to have some investors that are not going to take advantage of that. They're, you know, they're not going to want to pay that 3% and fine, you know, they will get stuck with a lien eventually. <laughs> because it's impossible not to spot all of them. So now we go into another stage. Let's suppose nobody successfully bids at the trustee sale. Now the property goes back to the bank. That's what's called REO. REO is what it stands for. It's really simple. It stands for real estate owned. So if you own a piece of real estate, that's REO. But usually the reference is only used for banks for some reason. And again, here's something that's been changed a lot. There was a time when you could contact the bank at this early stage, and if they were to get through all the legal hurdles involved in the foreclosure, sometimes they have to hang on to the property for a while to make sure that they really have clear title that they can pass on. Again, when the, you know, the bank forecloses, they pick up you know, some of these lien issues that they have to deal with as well. So, but before the property goes on the open market, you used to be able to contact a bank like Wells Fargo and say, hey, look, you've got three foreclosures in this neighborhood, and I'll give you 60 cents on a dollar form and get them all off your books. And you deal with a live person, and they would let you do that. Well, those days are gone, okay? <laughs> but that does not mean you as a realtor, let's suppose you have a buyer that's been, once the, they missed out on the trustee sale, they just really want that property. There's nothing wrong with the squeaky wheel concept by getting on the phone, trying to talk to a live person, and finding out, and if anything, you might find out who it's gonna get listed with, and, and et cetera. So, you know, that's the buying process side of it, right? Other than that, you just wait around, wait around until it actually goes on the open market, and if you miss it, you know. Now, as an agent, because we're talking about sales here, I wanna talk about short sales, pre-foreclosures, foreclosures. If you want something that's gonna make your phone Ring, if you're specializing in foreclosures, you no longer will need to pay for buyer leads. Your phone will ring off the hook. We used to have so many buyers contacting us about foreclosures when we had them in volume that we had to set up a separate phone line for any advertisement we did. And it had a little counter on it. This, again, this is an antiquated antique now, right? But I'd sit there while I'm working, watching the counter go up on this thing with people leaving messages about foreclosures. It would get into the hundreds by that evening and part of my routine was to sit and listen to all those messages. And they're almost always, a lot of them are investors or dreamers, whatever you want. Um, because you're doing foreclosures, they think, you know. They think it's a deal. Right. And it is what it is, but if, it, if it's a foreclosure, does that mean it's a good deal? Not if it's not priced right. Mm -hmm. But they do make the phone ring. You'll never pay again, I'll mention it, from buyer lead again if you're doing foreclosures. And a lot of times I get the same type of thing where a person would say, hey, you know, maybe you can help me. I'm looking for a good deal. I'm looking for a foreclosure. And, you know, it, maybe it's a house flipper, et cetera. And say, but I don't want this neighborhood, this neighborhood, or this neighborhood. And I'd always ask the person, and they'd name some bad neighborhoods, you know, whatever your definition of bad is. And I would ask them a question every time when they would say that. I would say, well, let me just ask you this. If a property that was worth 200,000 and I had it for 100,000 in that neighborhood, would you still buy it? And if they'd pause and say, no, I don't want anything in that neighborhood, immediately I knew I was talking to a rookie. 
One time I had some buyers make an appointment to meet with me in person and they sounded good on the phone and they showed up and they're in the conference room and I was late and um, I finally came in and they're waiting for me and I go in there and I shut the door and one of them stands up and says, I just want you to know that we don't have any money but we have a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> and I knew right then and there that they went to some late night or they watched a late night TV show and ended up in a seminar and they said, here's how you approach this real estate agent. So I do, I do uh, that was a very short meeting. So <laughs> I was very polite as I am to everyone. But, um, but again, you know, foreclosures will bring the buyers. So finding buyers is not going to be your problem. It's, it's getting the transactions done through the bank that's going to be your issue. So that's from the buyer's side of the foreclosure uh, issue. We're going to talk about listings. At one time, I had contracts in a certain certain zip codes with Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo, GMAC, United Bank of Texas, San Francisco Savings. I had a whole portfolio of them. And then once you have a few of those, when you talk to another bank, you know you have that on your resume. Then it makes it easier. Getting the first one obviously is going to be the hardest. Okay. It's gotten a lot harder to who those uh, properties get assigned to. So. Going back, before the property is listed, you might be able to talk to somebody, you may be able to put a deal together. It's not gonna be easy, but if you have a good buyer, or if you're looking for your, it's worth trying, because all it is is phone calls, right? And all they can tell you is no, right? Because they're gonna have a, a lot of, all the larger lenders or any Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, they're gonna have a whole process that they can't deviate from, you know? So they're gonna have to go through this listing process. Now, as an agent trying to get listings from the banks, one way that agents here, I know that have locally have been successful at it recently, do a lot of BPOs. And a BPO is basically uh, an appraisal. Um, they'll tell you in the instructions whether they, how many pictures they need, what kind of description they need. And you basically give that bank uh, an opi a broker opinion of value. And when I say broker, the banks don't care whether you're a broker or an agent, but in Idaho, Real estate law requires you to be a broker. Now, that also means that your broker can sign off on it and allow you to collect that income. And then they do a pay, pay a fee, and, and the fees vary. So there's agents who make extra income from doing this. I myself always made more income from sales, so this was just kind of a, a side thing that we had to do to keep the relationships going with the bank. So we would end up you know, reviewing them, but we'd have staff prepare them, and then we would sign off on them. So you know, we had assistants that would help us take care of it. Um, but, uh, you know, and they require you, you know, they, if, if you get on the list, um, you can get on a list for BPOs, you can apply for it. And uh, now, you're going to do a lot of BPOs that don't turn out to be foreclosures because banks order these for all kinds of reasons. One is, you know, loans are traded amongst lenders. Sometimes before a bank buys a loan or an investor buys a loan, that is, they're going to order a BPO on that to make sure the value is there, to make sure the property is not upside down or or some other reason, or to just get recent pictures of the property, making sure the property is in good shape. So there's all kinds of reasons, but the more you do, eventually they might assign you a listing. They will rarely assign the listing that you did the BPO on. They'll, that lender will assign you usually something else. And then once you break through that period, then you're on your way and you'll probably get, or potentially could get many listings in the future, but it's not guaranteed. There's agents that have done a gazillion BPOs and never got a listing, okay? So the other way, and again, this is uh, the shorter part of the class because it's not as complicated as the short sale process. Smaller banks are much easier. Um, I mentioned one of the banks that I mentioned was uh, United Bank of Texas. And uh, they literally on a, on a conference call with me and my partners, we just called them up one day, got the right person on the phone, uh, faxed, again, dating myself, uh, faxed over a resume, and uh, they were impressed with the other lenders we were represented, and we began listing all of their, they, they had a surprising amount of loans at that time. I don't even know if they're still around. They had a surprising amount of loans in our market at that time. Another one was San Francisco Federal. That was a vice president of a bank. I showed up without an appointment. I just happened to be downtown, and I looked up, and I saw a sign that said San Francisco Federal, and I had time to kill. I got on an elevator. I went up, and I found out what floor. I said, who's in charge of foreclosures? And they gave me a person's name. I went and knocked on their door, and they met with me, and I introduced myself. And he says, well, I've got one coming up right now, and he gave me a listing. 
And so it, that still can be done with the smaller lenders or the portfolio loans. And of course, do you know the difference between a portfolio loan and a regular loan? A portfolio loan is more like what people think lending was or is. And that is that a bank takes people's deposits and then they have this money to invest. And so they take that money that you deposited from your paycheck and they produce a loan. Well, there still are some of those exist. There's quite a few of them in the commercial realm and so forth. So portfolio loans are the ones where you most likely will be dealing with an individual at a bank. The good news is you've you got a better chance of getting that listing. The bad news is there's just not enough of them out there. So, um, but every listing counts. And so I've just about covered um, the majority of this subject um, that I intended to. Uh, like a lot of other subjects, there's absolutely no way for me to cover every scenario, every type of lien that I was able to successfully remove from a property, um, all the different ways. But the most important thing to remember, and I mentioned this in the buyer's classes, this class is from an agent standpoint. You're, this is for you representing the public. In your normal course of real estate, just about every day, you get a chance to take advantage of people. And the people that do that, they're not going to last long in this business. When you're doing foreclosures and short sales, you're going to get lots of chances to take advantage of people. And again, your career is going to be very short if that's what your intention is. So um, if there's any more questions? I had a question. Like, have you typically approached like larger banks? What have, how, what's your success rate with like, the Buffy Bots Credit Unions in Idaho? Like, has that been pretty helpful to like, go to a mountain? Credit unit, like high folks. I would contact every one of them and try. Okay. Because that's how you're going to find out. <laughs>